It works.
Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, who greets us in this and every season, whose word never fails, whose promise is sure. Amen. Let's confess our sins in the presence of God and of our neighbors. Merciful God, we confess that we have sinned, we have hurt our community, we have squandered our blessings, we have ordered our bounty in the name of Jesus. Forgive us and grant us your mercy. Righteous God, we confess that we have sinned, we have failed to be honest, we have lacked the courage to speak. We have spoken falsely. In the name of Jesus Christ, forgive us and grant us your mercy. Hear these words of assurance. God is a cup of cold water when we thirst. God offers boundless grace when we fail. Claim the gift of God's mercy. You are freed and forgiven. In the name of Jesus Christ.
turn now to the scriptures for today. Please join with me reading the Psalter, which is Psalm 133, Psalm 20. How good and how pleasant it is when kindred live together in unity. It is like fine oil upon the head, flowing down upon the beard, upon the beard of Aaron, flowing down upon the collar of his robe. It is like the dew of Hermon falling down upon the hills of Zion. For there the Lord has commanded the blessing, live forevermore. Second reading comes from the prophet Isaiah, chapter 56, verse 1, and then skipping to verses 6 through 8. Thus says the Lord, maintain justice and do what is right, for soon my salvation will come, and my deliverance will be revealed. And the foreigners who join themselves to the Lord to minister to him, to love the name of the Lord and to be his servants, all who keep the Sabbath and do not profane it, and hold fast my covenant, these I will bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices will be accepted on my altar, for my house shall be called a house of prayer for all peoples. Thus says the Lord God, who gathers the outcasts of Israel, I will gather others to them besides those already gathered. The word of the Lord. Thank you, speak. The message today um, is coming from both the scripture readings that the, Josh led you in the short psalm and the ones that and the, and the one that you that you just heard me read from Isaiah. Beginning with Psalm 133, a uh, really short psalm to the point. It's one of those psalms that makes um, an excellent vehicle to repeat, to learn it, and then to repeat it again and again and again, because um, as so many people have pointed out, that's the kind of, of psalm that as you read it, every time you read it, each time you read it, in, in fact, you get some more out of it because it's applied to what you're going through and what's happening, and the metaphors in it are rich, and I'll talk about those in a minute. The psalm focuses on unity. The, this concept of unity here in Psalm 133 is compared to something that is holy. And then it talks all about oil, right? We know that oil is used traditionally, um, used to anoint or impart a blessing. From the anointing with oil of the infant or adult in baptism, sealing them with the sign of the cross, connecting them as God's own forever, to the blessing that comes from anointing with oil uh, represents when a child of God is in need of healing. Or, at the end of one's earthly journey in in preparation for their transition to eternal life, we often anoint with oil. So in that context, here again, the first two verses of Psalm 133, this time from the contemporary English version translation of the Bible, the first metaphor of the psalm, it is truly wonderful when the people of God live together in peace. Now here's the metaphor. It is as beautiful as olive oil poured on Aaron's, view, on Aaron's head and flowing down his beard and the collar of his robe. Remember now, the people who heard this when it was first written would know that Aaron, mentioned in the psalm, is a priest of the so-called High Temple in Jerusalem, a holy man of God, a symbol of all God's children who benefit from this abundance of flowing oil. One scholar says it best, the overwhelming abundance of God's blessing is tangible in this overflowing oil reference. Imagine what it must have been like to have a whole vessel, a whole bottle of oil poured on top of your head. It gets everywhere. We're reminded of Mary pouring a whole jar of ointment on Jesus' feet and then wiping it with her hair and the criticism that she received because it looked so extravagant, so extra, as our young people would say. This overflowing oil symbolizes and is a message of great hope. This overflowing oil is a promise of life and abundance. This overflowing oil is a promise of life and abundance. 
abundance forevermore. We see clearly that the unity caused and created by the overflow of oil everywhere can have an effect on every part of our lives. A, un a kind of unity that comes from this oil flowing everywhere, and as it works, that overflowing and abundant oil works its way into all the cracks, bringing blessings that abound and remind us that God is always present in all these special ways. The second metaphor coming in the third, in, in verse three is another great visual, like the first here is all of Psalm 133 again. It is wonderful when the people of God live together in peace. The first metaphor is as beautiful as olive oil poured on Aaron's head and running down his beard and the collar of his robe. And now the second one, it is like dew from Mount Hermon falling on Zion's mountains where the Lord has promised to bless his people with life around. Like the oil flowing everywhere, the metaphor for blessings. Now we have this. In my mind, it's an amazing metaphor of dew. Um, I don't know if you think about that when you come out early in the morning and you find dew all over the place, on the roses and every place else. Sometimes on your windshield is where you notice it. One scholar reminds us that we don't make dew. D-E-W. It just happens. When that dew happens, it refreshes everything. Even and especially those parched and dried out places. There's a direct connection to the first metaphor for an overflowing oil. This notion of blessings flowing down in abundance, being everywhere, touching everything. A wonderful illusion of the Holy One's extravagant and abundant and without limit blessings that we receive. A way of doing and being. Thanks be to God. Blessings coming the way of all who believe, creating and connecting and forming unity, unity in Christ. And in the midst of that unity, we see and feel and experience and watch the sense of giving and providing by a loving God that comes from the unity of God's people who are seeking reconciliation and renewal in the name of the Prince of Peace. This kind of unity and renewal creates and causes justice to happen. And it also assists all of us in doing justice, loving kindness, as we walk humbly with our God. Which leads us directly into the reading from Isaiah 56. Isaiah 56 is all about justice and unity and inclusion. As it says in verse 1, maintaining justice, not looking for justice, not hoping for justice, not looking to create justice. No, Isaiah 56 starts with, thus says the Lord. Maintain justice. In another translation, it says, maintain justice and do what is right. In this passage, we see again an emphasis on unity and doing God's work together. It seems to me to be teaching us that we, that we must together do the work of the kingdom. That is, to work for justice. Isaiah 56 brings the message, the divine message, that God's dream of the world is much bigger than any or anybody's national identity. A commentator clarifies here, saying, we see God's attitude toward foreigners and the displaced and how they are welcomed in the local worship practices. Inclusion here is not passive. It, 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 it's a proactive going out and gathering in of the displaced outcasts and strangers who then, when they arrive, are given equal status. Commentator continues, everyone's worship is acceptable. There is a profound and radical sense of inclusion. The boundaries around who or what is acceptable are being ripped off. This practice of radical welcome to all shows who you are, and I would add, who we are together in unity as God's people. A couple of more important things. Too often when we talk about welcoming and welcoming the stranger and we hope that in welcoming we might feel good. And this welcoming might connect us one to another. This is often the motivation for a sign in front of so many churches that it, you've seen it, it says all are welcome, right? Either on their sign board like we have, or it's a banner in front of the church. There's one right now in the neighborhood here. When you drive down um, Chestnut Street, you can see it. You can, I mean, Cedar Crest 
over and you can see it. We are all are welcome. The hope and the intention being that new people need to come and new people will be welcome when they come and everything will be and stay the same because we are welcoming. And can't you see the sign? All are welcome. What actually is so often true and because with each new one, each new one who joins us, an infant baptized or an adult new member, the community of faith will never be the same again and that is a very good thing. Thanks be to God. Most scriptural teaching on welcome teaches us that the so-called strangers often bring with them God's own message. Thanks be to God. A new message sometimes, or a twist in the message, but a message nonetheless. The message that they bring is often coming in to disrupt and transform, but disrupt and transform in only the ways that God's own message can disrupt and transform. And it's not disrupt and transform aren't bad things. They often are very good things. A scholar reminds us, God's dream announces the deliverance of many, not just the power group. God delivers the Israelites out of Babylon, but as a twist, God says that my holy mountain, where God dwells, will welcome, quote, those who keep my Sabbath and do not profane it and hold fast my covenant, as it says in verse 6 of Isaiah. And then it reminds us in verse 7, these I will bring to my holy mountain. That means the community is no longer defined by a test of religious doctrine or membership in a specific church. It's not, it's, it's not a test of bloodline or pedigree, correct theology, institutional credentials. None of these are guaranteed doorways to deliverance. God makes clear that faithfulness, even faithfulness of so-called foreigners, will determine who is brought into the, quote, the house of prayer for all people, unquote. It says that in verse 7. And sometimes, the most challenging notion of all, that deliverance is offered to those who walk the walk and not just, don't just talk the talk. This continuing theme of inclusion is found in both Psalm 133 and the beginning of Isaiah 56 is strongly linked with justice also. The most important notion is so often really difficult to live into, to live into this if that notion. If everyone is welcome to the kingdom of God, then we must not be putting barriers in the way of any group or person coming to know God for themselves. How do we make sure that the church can be a house of prayer for everyone? Are there contemporary practices that we might be taking part in that exclude or exploit people coming to worship God? I don't have any answers, but it's certainly a lot to think about. Being a community of faith, a church that is open to all people doesn't happen by accident, but it takes the whole body of Christ, that's all of us, to commit to actively participating in doing justice and practicing this inclusion. As we attempt to do all this, we, as the children of a living and loving God, become part of the ongoing story of the gospel. The story of the gospel as we learn it in scripture. You know, going out to Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, <coughs> Pennsylvania, and all of the U.S., as well as today, Zoom, Facebook, Google, and the ends of the internet. So now, as we prepare our hearts and our minds to partake in Holy Communion Eucharist together. Listen again to Psalm 133. It is truly wonderful when the people of God live together in peace. It is as beautiful as olive oil poured on Aaron's head and running down his beard and the collar of his robe. It is like the dew from Mount Hermon falling on Zion's mountains, where the Lord has promised to bless God's people with life forevermore. Where the Lord has promised to bless God's people with life forevermore. We pray that it is so.
we believe using the words of the Apostles' Creed, the Baptismal Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, the Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, and died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life of the Amen. Dear God, we are thankful for all that you have given us. You are with us in all the challenges of life. We bring to you our prayers for others. For people who are struggling with their health, be it physically or mentally. For people who are in difficult relationships with partners, family, friends, or colleagues. For people who have experienced loss and are struggling with bereavement. For the people who are filled with uncertainty and are struggling financially. Loving God, bring us all peace, comfort, and hope. We pray for the leaders of our world. Guide our politicians and diplomats that they may be truthful, just, and caring as they communicate and take action on our behalf. Bless our government leaders and country with the willingness to do your work, to be inviting, supportive, and loving of all people, and care for all of your creation. God, we pray for all of you. Bring peace for people caught in the indifferent destruction of war. Bring hope for all those who cannot see an end to their struggling and despair. Empower us all in whatever way we can to work to bring relief, peace, and care to each and every situation we encounter. May we work with you, Holy Spirit, to bring hope. And all of this we pray in your name. Amen. We're fortunate each week as we gather to be able to give back a small portion of all that we have, for all that we have indeed does belong to God. So at this time, let us bring forth our tithes and our offerings. God be 
with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to God most high. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at, at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our Savior, Jesus Christ, who on this day overcame death and the grave, and by his great, his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. And so, with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the host of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. our Lord. It is offered freely to all who believe. There's no barrier to participation. All are welcome. As we continue today, most of you are familiar with this, but I like to review it every once in a while. We're using this little com uh, compartmented communion. The top side it, with the wafer, you peel that back. You can peel that back ahead of time and be ready. And then wait, flip it over, and peel um, the side for the cup, um, and that's how we will commune together. By eating this bread and drinking this cup, we proclaim Christ's death, and we celebrate Christ's resurrection, and we await Christ coming again. Amen. Come, Christ Jesus. Remembering, therefore, Christ's salutary command, his life-giving passion and death, his glorious resurrection and ascension, and the promise of Christ coming again, we give thanks to you, O Lord God Almighty. Not as we ought, but as we are able, we ask you mercifully to accept our praise and thanksgiving, and with your word and Holy Spirit, to bless us, to bless us, your servants, and these, your own gifts of bread and of wine, so that we and all who share in the body and blood of Christ may be filled with heavenly blessing and grace and receiving the forgiveness of sin, may be formed to live as your holy people and be given, your, give, be given our inheritance with all your saints. To you, O oh God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, be all glory and honor in your holy church, now and forever. And now let us join our voices together, praying the prayer that Jesus himself taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever.
Lord took bread, and after he broke it, he blessed it, and he said, This is my body, broken for you. Eat you all of it. And likewise, he took the cup, and he blessed it, and he poured it out, and he said, This is the new covenant, poured out for the remission of your sins in my blood. Drink you all of it. Receive this blessing. The body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. We thank you, generous God, for the refreshment we have received at your banquet table. Send us now to spread your generosity, your unity, your peace into all the world through the one who is our dearest treasure, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Please stand and, and join in singing of our As you go forth from this place, seeking unity and transformation, coming together as God's people to do God's work, welcome all. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon you and give you peace, now and always, and unto ages of ages. Amen.
Go in peace. Serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.